Welcome to Garden DC, the podcast about everything gardening in the Washington DC and Mid-Atlantic region. I'm your host, Kathy Gents. I'm the editor of Washington Gardener Magazine, and we're aimed at gardening enthusiasts, people who grow everything from edibles to ornamentals, natives to exotics. If it grows in our area, that's what we talk about. Welcome to episode 115 of the Garden DC podcast. In this episode, we talk with Heather Andrews, the thoughtful gardener, about dealing with the spotted lanternfly invasion of the mid-Atlantic United States. And we talk about some beneficial insects and how to support them as well. The plant profile is on blackberry lily, and we share what's going on in the garden, as well as some upcoming local gardening events. This episode of Garden DC, we're joined by Heather Andrews, the thoughtful gardener. She is a published author, photographer, and routinely works with homeowners and businesses to create sustainable native pollinator habitats. Welcome, Heather. Thank you so much for having me, Kathy. Thanks for being on. And you get the uh, pleasure of talking about one of the most dreaded topics in (laughs) mid-Atlantic gardening today, which is the spotted lanternfly. Um, So we'll dive into everything about that insect and why it strikes fear into some people's hearts and maybe some of the tactics we can do to uh, rein it in a little bit. But I don't want this to be a total depressing episode. So I think we'll talk about some good bugs as well and some good news on the pollinator scene as well as some beneficial insects. How about that, Heather? Sounds fun. I am looking forward to it. Great. So you have your own pollinator way station called the Cat a Pillar Haven and cat like cat. So I know that you're an animal lover as well. Absolutely. I have four garden supervisors that join me when I'm working in the thoughtful garden and they're very quick to point out things they want me to notice and see while they're out there. Uh, they were helping with bringing in the harvest this morning. They wanted to show their dad, their cat dad, all of their beautiful tomatoes and things they've grown. They're super proud of themselves. So um, it's a lot of fun to also just be surrounded this time of year with lots of visitors to the way station. So I typically get up with the four leggeds to get them fed and watered. And then we're out in the garden usually by 530 and we will be greeted by all kinds of birds, butterflies, Uh, Lots of really interesting creatures like we have raccoons and skunks. So it's it's never boring when you're out in the pollinator way station of who might actually be visiting. Were you always an animal lover? And I guess we'll dial it back to all the way when Heather was a baby. Were you born with a (laughs) green thumb and chlorophyll in your veins and an interest in insects as well? So as a little girl, one of my chores was to pull rose, uh, pull weeds in my dad's rose garden, which I absolutely did not appreciate at the time. But my grandfather, Andrews, was a gardener and I was one of 12 grandchildren. And he used to take me for long walks in his garden in the summer and tell me that when his garden did well, it was because his beehives were doing well. So I filed that little piece of information away. Uh, Growing up in the South uh, and moving to the, the Arctic Northeast where our growing season is about five minutes long, I knew I had to do something to juice my garden. So I started just intuitively putting native pollinator plants, herbs, flowers in my vegetable garden to try to attract those insects to my garden so that I could grow more food. And that first year, I had such a huge bumper crop that I started calling my neighbors going, if you don't get over here, I'm going to reverse ding dong ditch you. I'm going to leave produce on your doorstep, ring the bell and run away. I was just (laughs) overwhelmed. with produce, but I'm a clinical researcher by day and I'm surrounded by lots of ag educational schools that put out great research. And what my granddaddy Andrews taught me all those years ago 
clinical research has absolutely confirmed, which is if you can get pollinators in your garden, you can grow about 30% more food. So it increases your yield and it also decreases the pet pre uh, pest pressure. And in my case, I do have a genetically compromised cat. So having chemicals in my yard is not an option. We have a completely organic and sustainable garden. And uh, that just means I have more pollinators. Your garden today, let's describe that for our listeners. So my garden today, um, I am on about one and three quarter acres. About half of that is wooded with a small creek, uh, which routinely overflows now because this is one of the uh, fastest growing counties in the state of Pennsylvania. So we unfortunately um, have, you know, a lot of development, which results in um, a lot of flash flooding. The uh, upper part of the garden, which does not flood, is my pollinator garden. It sits on hard packed clay. Uh, when we moved into this house, it was a foreclosure and the previous owner had a play set there. So I tried to dig it. I tried to garden in it and realized very quickly that I was a failure. It was like a swampy mess. So I initially put in some raised bed systems and have continued to add to that. And my native plant garden is right there beside my vegetable garden. So again, because of the way this lot is structured on a hill, my landscaper who does the heavy lifting around here, um, I, there are things I physically can't do. So there were a lot of stones that were left over from the building of this house. So he's like, I could build you a couple of walls. And that's really how this got started was a couple of stone walls that we put our vegetable garden in. And then once I realized that the pollinators were so prolific that I could be a part of the solution and I 100% blame the uh, master gardeners of Perry County because they insisted when I went to their native plant sale that I take milkweed with me. I had no idea what I was getting into. I, I was a little intimidated, but I said, okay, sure. And I threw it in the garden and the caterpillars ate those two milkweed plants to the ground that year. And then I was hooked. I'm like, okay, I have to have more. <laughs> so this is a, a huge outgrowing of their teaching me about native plants and my first year failures of trying to grow things that aren't from here, which is really a good segue, Kathy, into unintended consequences of things that aren't from where you live. Mm -hmm. Because spotted lanternflies were accidentally introduced into Pennsylvania. And it's on something that's quite innocuous. They were introduced on landscape stones from Asia. Now, why you would bring lands landscape stones to Pennsylvania, I'm not really sure. We are called the Keystone State for a reason. There's a lot of rock here. But you would not think that bringing landscape stones in would be a problem. But sadly, those stones had little tiny microscopic egg masses on them, and they just assume they were mud because that's what they look like. Now the majority of Pennsylvania is under quarantine. That has spread into Maryland, Virginia, and now New York and Ohio. And I'm starting to see on the most recent map that now it's into Indiana. Hmm. So it's an unintended consequence that sometimes when you introduce things that aren't from where you are, you create a problem you did not mean to have. Absolutely. Yeah, and I'm hearing reports from New Jersey as well as surrounding states as well. And we can trace that back, which is, I think, incredible that they can trace it back to that shipment that was in 2014 in Berks County, Pennsylvania. And to let listeners know, in Perry County, Pennsylvania is a big state. Are you closer to Philadelphia than Pittsburgh, correct? Great question. So I am closer to Philadelphia. I live in Cumberland County and I am now a Cumberland County Master Gardener. I'm approximately two hours from Philadelphia and about four hours from Pittsburgh. 
So I live in what's considered South Central Pennsylvania. And is that zone six predominantly? We are seven AB. Yay. So you get to push a little bit more from your what you're used to growing in the South. Yes, definitely a much more condensed growing season. Our last frost is about May 15th. So um, it's really, really challenging to start vegetables and get them going because it's so cold in the spring. So I have adopted a method of vegetable growing, which I recommend for any kind of bed. Every new bed that goes in for myself or a client is using a no-dig method, but I have adopted Charles Dowding's no-dig gardening uh, way of making beds. And one of the advantages in our area because it's so cold in the spring, is that it is pure compost. So that soil is significantly warmer than a standard bed. So a lot of my transplants actually get to be moved out pretty quickly because it's about soil temperature, not air temperature. Mm, Exactly. And it's handy to have a soil thermometer, but if you don't own one, you can always look it up on one of the farmer's websites online, too, to find the, the local ground temperatures. So back to our dreaded topic of the spotted lanternfly. I was in Pennsylvania touring gardens recently, and I felt like the spotted lanternflies were almost as thick as the cicada invasion we just had recently. <laughs> and it seemed like they're not as clumsy an insect. They just don't run into your head, but they seem to not be afraid of humans at all. They, they congregate in large numbers all over the ground. They will jump into your drink if you let them. They will certainly, you know, hitch a ride on your hat or shoulder as well. So they're kind of almost gregarious insects, I would describe them, versus, you know, the flighty, runaway type insects. What has your experience been with them, Heather? So we definitely have um, experienced them really. We've been in the quarantine zone in Cumberland County now for over two years, but I really started to see them in any kind of noticeable activity last fall. And I'm sure my neighbors thought I was completely insane as I swatted my maple tree hundreds and hundreds of times. The challenge is all of those adults um, can be responsible for over 50 young. So it's incredibly important when you see them as beautiful as they are when they spread their wings, they, they really need to be stomped and killed. I will say there is some good news. Um, the good news is that, again, being an agricultural state, there are some things that the state is doing to try to mitigate um, the invasion. It is a huge problem for us. Our state is one of the top exporters of hardwood, and they do love maple trees. They love walnut trees. They, we are also one of the top exporters of food in the United States, and they have a tendency to attack things like grapevines. So it's devastating for many of our industries in the agricultural area, and they believe it will cost us about 50 million and 800 jobs this year. So what can you do, right? So obviously the the first one's pretty easy. There is a specific, very sticky tape that you can wrap your trees in, but you're not done. The challenge is that this is a huge time of year where our wildlife centers are impacted by people trying to do the right thing, ban their trees, and unfortunately birds and bats get stuck to that tape. So you're not done when you ban the tree with the sticky tape. You also need to cover that either with a screening material. You can also use fabric, like what you would use to cover your plants to prevent it from frosting over. The other thing you've got to be willing to do is go out and change those bands because within about 36 to 48 hours on my walnut tree, it is full. It's it's disgusting. So it's work. And my neighbor was out of town on vacation, so I agreed to manage his trees while he was gone. And it's just... It's really hard not to be disheartened because they're just everywhere. The way I look at this is everyone that you take out of commission is 
50 less. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. um, so by smashing and by catching on tape, that, that's great. Uh, there are also some homemade and state programs where they are doing circle traps, which is similar to what we've talked about, but they're using uh, plastic bags and the screening material with the band. And City of Harrisburg, if you're a resident, is giving those away free. The PA Agriculture Department has also used a chemical, dinoturf. I'm probably saying this wrong, dinoturfuran. <laughs> Don't say that three times fast. The challenge is that chemical is sadly going to kill everything else. It's mm-hmm. non-specific. So the good news is they are studying this summer a biopesticide, Bovaria bassiana. It is soil fungus that has shown promise in killing them. In my own yard, what I am seeing, I think, is actually good news. Uh, I am seeing native praying mantises snacking on them. And anytime I find a native praying mantis down in my pollinator garden, I'm carrying it up to the trees where I know my lantern flies are hanging out. Uh, So he's helping me manage, Mm -hmm. which is wonderful. We are seeing birds getting reports of cat birds and blue jays that are eating them. So we were concerned initially that no one was eating them, but that's not the case. There are more and more reports of that. And you're going to love this one. The Hmm. cicadia killers are attacking. That's good news. Yes. And I was going to say, it sounds like a very similar situation to the stink bug invasion we had a few years ago, the brown marmorated stink bug, which was an alien species, not the, the normal. We do have stink bugs, but not to that number that we had a few years ago and that we just had a huge inundation. Nothing was eating them, nothing. (laughs) And then finally, after a year or two, chickens started to figure it out. Other birds started to figure out and the population has dropped drastically as predators have figured out that this might be something yummy to eat in large numbers. It's a a great thing. And what I would say people can do if they want to help, I mean, first, obviously, uh, the stage they are at right now is the third instar and fourth instar of the nymph stage. So black and white and red, black and white, and then the adults. So I'm starting to see more and more adults now that it is late summer, which is typical. But those adults will start leaving what looks like gray muddy patches and they'll lay them on anything flat, including your car. So if you're heading into quarantine zones, make sure you walk around your car very thoroughly before you leave um, and make sure they haven't laid any um, egg masses on your equipment. This goes for camping equipment as well. And I will say our nurseries are very good to check your plants thoroughly to make sure that you're not taking home an uninvited guest. Mm-hmm. So, but they, these things are crazy. I have seen them hanging onto my windshield. Yikes. <laughs> I usually will pull off and try to smash them so I don't accidentally introduce them to somewhere else. Yeah, at the Perennial Plant Association meeting, which was in Lancaster County a week or so ago, they posted warnings daily and did some announcements as well to, to make sure people were inspecting their cars, their luggage, you know, the underside of your purse, whatever you have. So you're not bringing a spotter lanternfly home, like a whole adult with you or the egg masses, right. um, either of those. And you had used a word earlier to describe them, which was beautiful. And so I wanted to talk about that a little bit and to say that that is one of the fear I think of people is that people are not going to crush them or kill them because they're not a horrible ugly insect you know they they actually have the the spotted wings are attractive to some people that they might play with them you know a small child or something or might keep them as a, a little insect pet for a while and encourage them and not recognize them for the damage that they're doing to the environment and to our agricultural industry. It's certainly an issue and it is about, you know, educating. Uh, We have a a business manager that works for my husband who lives in another state and was here yesterday. And as we're eating dinner, one came to visit right on the other side of the glass. And he was like, what is that? You know, (laughs) so 
we started explaining and my husband knows how much time I spend out in the garden trying to get rid of them. And when they get in your hair, it's really gross. I mean, you know, it, it just, they're, and it's, it's easy to get overwhelmed because they release through their urine, a very sticky substance, which lovingly is called honeydew. That sounds kind of nice actually, but <laughs> I, when I stand under my maple tree, it's like you're getting rained on. It's really disgusting. But it then falls on the plants underneath and creates black sooty mold. So it can kill your plants. And because they get onto people's houses and decks, it creates this black sticky substance everywhere, which people get really overwhelmed and frustrated very quickly. And so then they start doing crazy things. And this is the part that scares me because people are giving out bad advice. So I encourage you, if you are not familiar with the subject, please visit your county extension offices online. Master gardeners love to help people solve problems and we can help you solve this problem, but we don't want to go to the extreme and actually potentially hurt you, your children, your pets, or other pollinators because you take it upon yourself to do something that really is too much. And we call this integrated pest management. And the first you know, rule of integrated pest management is first do no harm. Try to do the least invasive, least damaging thing you can do first. And the first mm -hmm. would be to try to smash or scrape ideally scrape with a like plastic um, old hotel card into a plastic bag with alcohol. Do not scrape the egg masses onto the ground because the eggs can still live. But sadly, while my neighbors were gone, unbeknownst to me, their, their tree service showed up and sprayed their trees. And I explained to my neighbor that, okay, you might have killed your lanternflies, but Everything good in your yard potentially just got killed too. And I think this is the other challenge is try to work with things that aren't going to harm our soil, air, water, and other insects or animals. And again, we don't want to create a new problem. I, I feel like we, we solve a problem and we create a new one. And that's the challenge I'm running into right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've heard people use things as simple as a vacuum and just vacuum them up and get rid of them that way. Of course, you don't you want to empty out that canister or bag because uh, you could create a very stinky situation once they start to decay inside that. So if you're squeamish about touching or you know crushing by hand any of these insects, you could certainly do that. And just for your information, they do have a tendency to jump up and back. And so one of the ways I deal with them, because they seem to be attracted to certain plants in my garden, uh, I find them almost every morning on my okra, on my kiwi uh, vines. So I just take some of that sticky tape and wrap it around my hand and then hold it behind them. And when they jump, it's almost like I've got a magnet. <laughs> they jump onto the tape hmm. and then I just throw that tape away. So, so that can be another way. The other thing I would recommend to your listeners is if you have tree of heaven in your yards, I would remove it. Uh, tree of heaven is their host plant. Um, that's Alanthus and it is allopathic. So it actually crowds out our native species and secretes a chemical into the soil that's toxic to the surrounding plants. It also can, depending on how close it is to your house, it's a water seeker, it can actually crack your foundation. Before you have spotted lanternflies, I would absolutely consider getting rid of this invasive plant. Yeah, the tree of heaven is almost always confused with our native sumacs as Correct. well. So definitely have a correct ID because there's some beautiful native sumacs and some cultivars like that we have in the trade, but get a positive idea that it's Allianthus altissima, that it is the common tree of heaven. Sometimes it's called varnish tree or it has various names in Asia as well that you might be familiar with it that way. 
but definitely positively ID it. Um, just from the flowers, it's a huge difference between sumac and that one. And one of the ways we teach people, because we have lots of beautiful sumacs this time of year too, is bend the actual limb of the tree of heaven. And it, if you crush the limb or the leaves, it distinctly smells like burnt peanut butter. And sumac absolutely does not. It also has a leaf that is very, I would say, jagged edged, where the sumac tends to be more smooth looking. So, I mean, there's definitely, again, the extension office has these native plant lookalikes. So to help you identify them, but scent is a really big one. It really smells like overcooked peanut butter. Hmm. Yeah, and I would say definitely look at the flowers. You know, most most Alianthus have the little white kind of almost not very noticeable spray of flowers versus that beautiful cone on the red cone on the sumacs. Correct. Correct. That's going to be your big, big difference to see there. But that's a great tip to be able to ID that and to remove those from your landscape because that will bring clusters of spotted lanternfly. They are also attracted to, you've mentioned before, your grapevines and stone fruits and anything in the malice species. So that can really impact if you say have a peach tree or something like that in your landscape. Definitely. So we certainly want to help our farmers as much as we can. And what we can do is to try to help protect them and we can protect them by doing our part. And those tree of heavens, believe it or not, grow exceptionally fast. One year, just out of, out of curiosity, before we had them in our county, uh, I just wanted to see how fast it would grow. And it went from a seedling to the end of the summer at five feet. You can't just cut it, though. You must dig it out because it will re-sprout. It grows um, much like many of our trees that grow by rhizome. So uh, it's really important that you remove it. If it's a big one, you're probably going to have to have it professionally removed, roots and all. Mm-hmm. And it's also good to note that spotted lanternfly don't bite or sting or attack people or pets. So, you know, you don't have to fear them in that way. They're not going to just jump up and bite you if you try to grab one or something like that. So what about some of the, I'm hearing a lot of home remedies, like a white vinegar in a spray bottle or neem oil. What do you think of some of those? I think you could try it, but I don't know that it will work. Uh, So I have purchased some of the soil bacteria. I have been holding it or hoarding it, if you want to say, in a way because I've been waiting for the adults to emerge, thinking that it'd probably be more beneficial because in some cases they're going to lay egg masses that are too high for me to reach. And so they have a tendency to crawl up and down the trunk of the trees And that's when I felt like I probably could spray them versus looking like the crazy lady I was last fall trying to swat hundreds of them. Yikes. And I was just reading about the area that a spotted lanternfly can cover. So from, you know, walking or hopping, it's more of a hopping type of insect. They don't really fly. Yeah, they have a little bit of flying, but amazingly, they can go three to four miles, which can tell you that, you know, all the bordering states of Pennsylvania, that's why they're on high alert. So, you know, from Delaware to New Jersey and New York and Ohio, everywhere, they're going to spread out from there. And I can make sure you have the link which shows the map and the current quarantine areas. The uh, web address for that is stopslf.org, and it will show you where they have been reported. And they do want you to report them. And I believe the number is 888 bad bug. <laughs> uh, but we'll make sure we give you that in the show <laughs> notes. <laughs> so yeah, I uh, had one land in my hair several years ago at King of Prussia. And I just about freaked out. I knew what it was, but it was so gross. It fell out of a tree. So I, I, I want people to know what they are. But then if they're not in a quarantine zone, I absolutely want you to report it. Mm-hmm. And you were mentioning the honeydew, how it creates a, a black kind of covering to some of your plants and can damage them that way. Another problem with that honeydew is it attracts 
stinging insects like bees and wasps are attracted to that and of course the city mold on your plants and your patio furniture your cars and everything else is not pleasant as well and i have been hosing down underneath uh, where these trees are located the the plants below to keep them from suffocating and i really hope that i don't have to take these trees down but if they get a big enough infestation that actually might be part of the solution. And for some of my clients who have these trees overhanging their houses, where it's causing a major issue, uh, that, that may be your only option, which is really sad that you have to take down the hardwoods. Mm-hmm. And those woods cannot be transferred to another place if they're in a quarantine area. That's correct. So um, this is, uh, you know, again, a major issue for us because we're a huge Christmas tree exporter, right? So they do not want you moving any wood of any trees to prevent the spread of these insect masses potentially into areas where they aren't currently. For our wrap-up of the spotted lanternfly, there are the host plants, the tree of heaven, that we can eliminate can obviously check our vehicles and all around them before we transfer things or bring things home. And are there any other final steps preventative that we can take? I'm definitely removing my walnut seedlings because I have walnut trees. My squirrels love to plant them all throughout the garden. So I do tend to find the spotted lanternflies congregating um, on a lot of those small uh, seedlings as well as removing the seedlings from the tree of heaven that appear because the seeds are desirable to birds. So I'd recommend that. I also do take out my wild grapevine for the same reason, because they have a tendency to congregate. My goal is to try to, as much as I can, get them off of my property so they're not causing um, damage to other plants that I would like them not to visit. So Uh, That has been an effective strategy so far, and as more research becomes available on the effectiveness of the soil bacteria, I think it's a good idea. I would love to see you ban trees, but only if you're going to do it responsibly. We don't want to now transfer a new problem onto our wildlife shelters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if you were to do the banding, obviously check it, you know, at least two or three times a day um, to make sure no other creatures are stuck there. Absolutely. And use the smaller bands. Um, That's one way uh, if something becomes stuck, it's less likely to get tangled in it if it's a skinny band versus a wide band where potentially they get their entire wing stuck. And I see that some homeowners are doing trunk injections in some of the trees that might be vulnerable. Are you familiar with that at all, Heather? I have not heard that that is working. So I'm always hesitant to talk about things that I'm not positive are going to actually impact the trees. So I'm not aware that that's been something that's being recommended. So I would check with your extension office if there is research to support it. I'm for it. Great. Well, everybody is warned and forearmed who doesn't have spotted lanternfly in their area yet, but be vigilant. And those who are already affected, our thoughts are with you and hope that, you know, the problem will subside quickly in the next year or two as predators move in and figure out that these are pretty yummy and nutritious insects. So that will be good. So let's turn to something more positive, Heather, and let's talk about monarchs and what we can do as gardeners to support them. Well, we're right in the thick of the monarch uh, migration starting at the top up in Canada and coming south. So that final push of that final uh, leg of the longest insect migration on earth. So super excited to tell you that I am seeing uh, some butterflies in the way station Compared to two years ago, and even as you saw on our garden tour, it is exceptionally low, uh, which is super sad that we're seeing ones or twos where this time of year I used to see dozens in a day or more and would have multiple butterflies hatching at any one time. The great count just occurred over the last week of the monarchs, and I'm excited to see what the citizen scientists are saying they're seeing in their own backyards I didn't participate this year because I was gone for four days um, during that time period where citizen scientists like you and me count the number of eggs and the instars of the 
uh, caterpillars and how many monarchs they're actually seeing. But what I can say in my own backyard is I had two very fat and happy caterpillars um, munching on my swamp milkweed. And uh, one uh, disappeared yesterday afternoon, so hopefully it went somewhere to make a chrysalis. But this is like my favorite time of year in the garden to watch my plants being mowed down by these hungry caterpillars. And what can you do? Uh, there's several things you can do. Obviously, plant milkweed. Native milkweeds to your area is one of your best strategies because that is their host plant. So in my area, the top milkweeds for egg laying, according to the research, are swamp and common milkweed. And not far behind is uh, our butterfly weed, which is shorter and does not have the sticky, sticky sap that our traditional milkweeds have if you're concerned about that. Latest research says plant two, um, and what they mean by that is two different varieties. Ideally, you would obtain those varieties within 100 miles of your location, so I would definitely check with your native plant nurseries as well as your master gardeners. Many times they sell seedlings for fundraisers, and it's possible that you might be able to obtain native milkweed to your area that is grown in your soil from your climate, and there is research to suggest ideally is more palatable and will promote a um, healthy butterfly. Yeah, I am seeing traffic on local garden club and discussion lists where people are seeing their milkweed be, you know, consumed by the monarch caterpillars, and then they're afraid that they don't have enough. So everybody's <laughs> asking each other for, for their extra milkweed plants. And yes. so if you have extra, you know, people are, are definitely looking for it. And I'm sure people who are trying to raise uh, the caterpillars too are looking for extra milkweed too. And certainly that is a challenge this time of year as a pollinator gardener. Inevitably, every year I run out of a host plant. I got a call um, from my mom who lives in North Carolina this morning, and she said, they've eaten all my dill. What do I do? And what she was talking about were swallowtails. So we were quickly coming up with other host plants that could be an option for her, putting out a 911 to her local garden club in her community, um, and then calling the nurseries to see if they had their host plants, which would be rue uh, as well as parsley. And uh, so that might be another option to make it uh, uh, available. She was like, well, will they eat the stalks? And I said, they sure will, but you're going to be out of stalks by the end of the day. I'm going <laughs> to tell you, you're going to be it. So last year, my, uh, my issue was I have Dutchman's pipe, which is uh, the native plant host for our pipe vine swallowtails, a beautiful blue and black butterfly kind of looks like a morpho from um, South America, if you've ever seen those bl beautiful blue butterflies. And I walked under my arch where this vine, you know, climbs, and I realized that all I had left was vine. It, the, the leaves were gone, and all, the, <laughs> all, all of the <laughs> vine was being consumed. So I did the exact same thing. I put out a 911 to someone that I knew had them. And there was an emergency transport of 12 pipevine caterpillars to his house because I had no, I didn't have enough. And um, so definitely if you will put out a message, there are other gardeners who'd be delighted to help you either uh, take those caterpillars for you or share milkweed. One caution, Kathy, I will say that I'm seeing with a lot of my followers is in their attempt to do the right thing, they're rushing out to the local nursery. And in some cases, that nursery might not have good control over their sourcing. Hmm. And in this particular case, I have seen this horror story multiple times this year where they have gone out, they have bought a new milkweed, typically tropical milkweed, which they do like, but you don't know your source, I wouldn't buy it. So in this particular case, uh, a new pesticide has been reintroduced uh, called neonicotinoids, um, neonix for short, and um, they're coming home and their caterpillars are all dead. So if your source cannot tell you whether or not that plant has or has not been treated, I would not buy it. Yeah, agreed that you need to be able to 
to say that it's pesticide free or how it was grown. And it does remind me on a lighter note, the, the book by Eric Carl, the very hungry caterpillar. <laughs> when they're in that, when that, in that growing stage, they are pretty voracious, you know, just like many small growing animals are, they just want to eat, 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 eat. And I have like lots of bronze fennel that I yes. grow and yes. they just love that. And luckily that grows pretty prolifically. Yes. But to your point, one caterpillar, if they were an infant, would consume approximately 2,000 cans of formula in approximately two weeks. Jeez. That is a very, <laughs> very hungry caterpillar. Right. So, and then it also helps for the home gardener to be able to ID and know that, yes, this is what I want to be eating and that's why I'm growing this milkweed uh, versus some other creatures or insects that might not be as beneficial. Absolutely. The other piece I would say is native plants and high value nectar sources. And if you're interested in learning more about high value nectar sources, Doug Tallamy, who is an insect expert that lives right here in Pennsylvania, but teaches at the University of Delaware has partnered with the National Wildlife Federation, and you can put your zip code into their native plant finder and determine which keystone species are the most beneficial when it comes to our uh, native birds and butterflies. And I really think that a lot of attention has been given to milkweed, which is important. We need 1 billion stalks of milkweed, but equally important is the high value nectar sources this time of year. If you can imagine a mama monarch flying into your yard, she's hungry and she's getting ready to do an activity which is going to be very calorie intensive. So to give her the best chance of laying eggs on your milkweed, it's really important that you support, surround that milkweed with those high value nectar plants and the fall migration, the two that are good for all areas that are super important, not only for the monarchs, but for all of our native butterflies is our asters and our goldenrods. Beautiful in combination as well. And if you love mums, you're going to love asters. They come in purple, pink, they're coming yellow. There's one for every garden, tall, short, mounded, and they are, have a very, very long bloom time. So really lovely. And they will come back next year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, everything from the white wood aster to the aster tartaricus, the, the Russian tall one, there's a space in your garden for asters, definitely. Absolutely. And there's over 200 uh, goldenrods, so same. Mm -hmm. <laughs> regardless of what you have, say uh, either sun or shade, uh, the wood asters you just mentioned will almost work in full shade. So it, it, there is one for every kind of condition. Now, last week, what I noticed when we were in these native plant gardens, the majority of the butterflies were visiting Joe pie weed and our native flocks. So uh, the flocks they were visiting is a uh, version called Jenna. And what we found really interesting at Stonely is just down the road from that Jenna, which was covered in swallowtails, was a cultivar, which was variegated. It was a white phlox and there was no one visiting it. So if at all possible, I would recommend staying with a native or a native var. The native vars are like little Joe pie weed. So our Joe pie weed tends to be nine to 11 feet tall, extremely tall. Mm -hmm. And little Joe is maybe a little more manageable for a home gardener at four to seven feet. But in my own garden, it's one of the pollinator favorites, bees, butterflies, hummingbirds. Everybody loves Joe pie. And uh, same for the flocks is just a magnet for uh, butterflies, including the monarch. Mm -hmm. Ditto for my garden, Heather. And for people who want to contact you, is your website the best way or how can people follow you online? 
So I'm the Thoughtful Gardener on Facebook, and we put up uh, postings every single day about native plants and things you can do to help support all types of pollinators. We also uh, have instructional videos on our YouTube channel, and that is called Garden Thoughtfully. And I also have the website called Garden Thoughtfully. So all of the rest of the channels are, are listed under that moniker. But we'd love for you to join us there and continue the conversation and lots of really beautiful pictures from all kinds of gardens right now and the visitors that are coming to say hello. Excellent. Thank you, Heather. And thank you for letting us know about the spotted lanternfly and the ways we can cope with it. And also some of the good news around our native pollinators and the plants that go with them. Any final thoughts you want to share with listeners? I mean, I definitely think even if your listener has a pot on their porch, they can make a difference. Uh, last year during pandemic, we couldn't do our plant sale at Master Gardener, but what we did instead was pollinator kits. And because I helped put those together, we were able to bring one home, which I put outside my husband's office. And we had not only hummingbirds coming to visit, but we had a swallowtail that came and laid eggs on the parsley, which then turned into a chrysalis. And we got to see the whole life cycle when it became a butterfly. So it isn't about turning your entire garden, although it would be great if uh, you would consider putting native pollinator plants in your traditional gardens. But if you could just do a pot on your porch, you can really help the monarch migration. Excellent advice. Thank you so much, Heather. It's my pleasure. Thanks so much, Kathy. Blackberry Lily Plant Profile Blackberry Lily Iris Domestica, previously Belimcanda chinensis, is a perennial plant that is native to parts of Russia and Asia. It is hardy to USDA zones 4 through 10. It is also known as the leopard lily due to its spotted flowers. However, it's not a true lily and is actually an iris relative. Hence, its recent Latin name change. Blackberry lily grows best in full to part sun and well-draining soils. It blooms in mid to late summer. It is heat and drought tolerant as well as being deer resistant. The flowers can range from yellow to orange to crimson. Once the flowers fade, they form a bright green seed capsule that dries to a light tan, then splits open to reveal the seeds inside. The common name, blackberry lily, comes from its beautiful seed heads that resemble a shiny blackberry fruit. These are quite attractive, left up in the garden in the winter and used in dried floral arrangements. It is not a long-lived perennial, but it does seed itself around if allowed to do so. It can also be propagated by division of the rhizome. Blackberry lily, you can grow that. What's new in the garden this week? Well, it's good to be home. I was away for over a week touring gardens in the Philadelphia area and Lancaster County part of Pennsylvania with the Perennial Plant Association and with GardenCom, the Association for Garden Communicators. Both of those meetings were terrific and I saw some incredible gardens and met some fascinating people, many of whom I will be inviting onto this podcast for interviews on future episodes. But so nice to be back in my own garden, although it is a bit overgrown and weedy at this point in the summer, thanks to all the consistent rains we've been getting in the DC area and to my benign neglect of several areas, which I will soon rectify. Over at the community garden plot, I was able to dig a small harvest of potatoes to add to the entries that we are submitting to the Montgomery County Fair in Gaithersburg, Maryland. You can go and visit the fair and look at the agricultural exhibits and cut flower entries and floral arrangements. That runs through August 20th. 
Um, also happening in the local gardening world is a fall fruit festival hosted by Edible Landscaping in Afton, Virginia. They are holding that on Saturday, September 3rd from 9 to 5. They're going to have a day of orchid tours, pawpaw tasting, medicinal plant walks, organic growing lectures, door prizes, and nursery-wide sales. You can find out more about that at edibelelandscaping.com. And I, our own magazine, Washington Gardener, is hosting an event that is open to everyone to attend and that is our 16th annual Washington Gardener photo contest at Meadowlark Botanical Gardens in Vienna, Virginia that takes place Sunday, September 4th from 12:30 to 1:30 p.m. and is an exhibit of all the stunning photos that were entered and won our recent garden photo contest for 2022 will be opening up for images to be entered for the 2023 cycle at the end of this year and we accept entries during the first three weeks of January. So look out for details on that contest if you are collecting your garden photos, your flower photos, your garden insect and animal photos. We're looking for them and we will be posting that details at Washington Gardener Magazine and on our blog. Happy gardening! In the new book, The Urban Garden by Kathy Jensen Terry Spade, you'll find dozens of inspiring and creative ways to grow flowers, shrubs, vegetables, herbs, and other plants in small spaces and with a limited budget. Whether you want to grow on a balcony, rooftop, front stoop, or a tiny urban patio, turn your growing dreams into reality and build a gorgeous and unique garden that showcases your personal style while still being functional and productive. With the ingenious ideas and resourceful tactics found here, you'll be maximizing yields and beauty from every square inch of your space while also making a lush outdoor living area you'll crave spending time in. Whether you're growing edible plants or beautiful flowers, the 101 amazing growing ideas found in the urban garden will turn your tiny urban yard into a treasure trove of green you'll be proud to share with family and friends. Buy your copy today at your local retail bookseller or order it online now at amazon.com or bookshop.org. Thank you for listening to Garden DC. You can become a listener supporter for as little as 99 cents a month by going to anchor.fm slash garden DC slash support. Another way to support this podcast is to subscribe to our monthly digital publication, Washington Gardener Magazine. To do so, go to washingtongardener.com. Thank you. You can find Washington Gardener online at WashingtonGardener.com, on Twitter at WDC Gardener, on Instagram at WDC Gardener, and on Facebook.com at Washington Gardener Magazine.